morning, everyone. My name is Mari Ford, and I'm the Director of Collections Ex and Exhibitions here at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art. Before we begin this morning's program, I'd like to welcome our fellow friend and sustainer members and guests. Thank you for joining us here this morning. Uh, your continued support makes programming like this possible. Again, thank you. We're in the final month of True Nature, Rodin in the Age of Impressionism. So you'll definitely want to see it or see it again before it closes on October 22nd. I'd also encourage everyone to visit our website to learn more about our upcoming exhibitions, Preston Singletary, Raven in the Box of Daylight, opening on November 11th, and Edith Head, Hollywood's costume designer, opening next summer. We're very excited for this morning's program, uh, designing exhibitions from concept to installation. Please hold all of your questions and we'll set aside some time at the end for answers. And now uh, to introduce this morning's speaker. Randall Barnes holds a BFA in studio art from Oklahoma State University. He joined the museum first as a contractor and then in 2015 as a full-time member of our art preparation team. From 2015 to 2022, he served as a preparator constructing, installing, and deinstalling all of the museum's varied exhibitions. In 2022, he succeeded to his current position of installation design manager. In this role, he works across departments to design our exhibitions and manage their complex installations. The word that best describes Randall's process is thoughtful because he's always putting the visitor experience at the forefront. Earlier this year, Randall led efforts to increase accessibility for all of our exhibitions through innovations for our blind and low vision visitors. Randall's attention to detail, high standards, and creative uses of color create engaging and memorable experiences with art for our guests. Please join me in welcoming Randall Barnes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Maury. Maury is our head of collections and exhibitions. Uh, this is kind of two departments, and Maury does this by himself. Uh, he's really the kind of leader that is on the ground doing the work. He's not really delegating tasks because he doesn't have anyone to delegate tasks to. But regardless of that, Maury is the kind of guy that's in there doing the work with his team and leading by example, and I'm truly grateful for that, so thank you, Maury. So, designing exhibitions um, at Oklahoma City Museum of Art. Today we're gonna talk about True Nature, Rodin in the Age of Impressionism, and then we'll take a quick look at Preston Singletary, Raven in the Box of Daylight, and continuing the shout outs before I move on, and as a show of respect to our community pioneers, as well as a way to preserve heritage and share knowledge, I would like to honor Suzanne Thomas, Romy Owens, Trent Lawson, and Ernesto Sanchez. Um, without these people, I wouldn't be in the place that I am today as a person or in my career. So thank you to them. Um, um, again, my name is Randall Barnes. Maury gave you a little bit of an introduction. I have been in the arts my entire life. I took my first drawing class at age 10. Um, I consider myself a community arts practitioner, which basically means not only am I an artist, but I'm a community servant, um, serving on boards and committees and uh, sort of guiding and help shape the future of our art community. Um, I've been in museum work for 10 years at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art for eight and the installation design manager for one. Um, and what that really means is that I'm guiding the collaborative process that brings all of our exhibitions together. This is the exhibition design, our curatorial department, graphic design, education, collections, visitor services, development, really reaching all departments. Um, and part of my succeeding to this job is that I was going to lead a collaborative process that put um, the needs of the departments before what I was trying to do. And so I'm really trying to just help facilitate the process um, bring creativity and the visitor experience to the forefront. 
So today, I'm going to talk about the exhibition design process for True Nature, Rodin and the Age of Impressionism. Uh, thank you to the organizers for this, which is the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the In As Much Foundation, and the George Records. Um, so from envisioning this design to building out the galleries and the installation of objects, we'll take a look into my personal creative process, um, but also the collaborative process in the museum and how we bring these exhibitions to life. Last summer, summer of 2022, we get an offer for Rodin. Um, and so we basically have 12 months to start planning and pulling this exhibition off, which is a long time, but also a short time um, for all of these things. So this was an extensive process on a short time. So getting started. Um, we're really kind of envisioning what Rodin could be. We're, we're familiarizing ourselves with a checklist we're researching Rodin, we're putting his work into context of his time, but also the time of today, and um, really just starting to imagine what this exhibition could be. And so for my creative part, this is where the creativity part comes in, and this is like the fun, enjoyable part that uh, makes the job really great. It all is really great, but this is like the, the really fun part. So we start kind of imagining what could Rodin be? And so I start, as I start my own research into Rodin, uh, maybe some of you heard the music that we were listening to earlier when we were coming in. Uh, this is a, called uh, Retro Wave. And Retro Wave is this 80s, 90s nostalgia that kind of latches on to early digital technologies and the sort of opulence of the 80s. And there's all these marble busts mixed with grids and digital images and so this is like this idea in my mind of like seeing these um, tremendous sculptures sort of lit in like a futuristic impressionist sort of way um, so like here for example in our top left we just have the lighting on here um, and while I'm sort of dreaming big about oh look at all this we could do this with crazy lights I'm also sort of being you know brought, brought back down to earth and so we kind of settle on this mood board, and this mood board is going to lead my creative process, and it's going to be a, a reference point. So when I kind of get out of the weeds, I can come back to this and recenter myself on what we're really trying to accomplish here. Um, and so the things we're sort of looking at with this mood board that are, that are leading my inspiration, my sort of muse for this, we're going to start with the Rodin Museum in Paris. And so these three images up here are those. And here we're really looking at the woodwork. How does our museum reflect this with our own wood floors and the elegance of this? Uh, we're looking at the gardens, this arcade wall, which will come into effect later. But really the gardens, thinking of a sculpture garden being with the objects. And here in the top, uh, this photo from when Rodin was working in his studio, and these are plaster sculptures, but really being immersed in the objects, like surrounded by them. Everywhere you kind of turn, there's objects, and you're amongst them. Um, so this is kind of our, our start. We want to be immersed in Rodin. We're really thinking about the process, this bronze glowing here. We're thinking about the bronze process. How does this all happen? Because Rodin is... Um, working with other people to really create the best work. And so um, we're interested in Rodin's process, but also this sort of new context of where is Rodin today? How is the past, present, and future of Rodin? And uh, thinking about those. And some of this is color palette here with these pinks and ambers, and then the blues here, and also the lighting. Um, we don't get this lighting, which I, I wish we would have, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but these also are little niches. So here's a little niche of a display. Here's a little niche of a display. And up here too, using this colored pedestal to highlight and create its own space. So these are the sort of concepts that we're working with, niches, uh, process, immersed in objects, and also taking inspiration from Rodin's Museum in Paris. So we have our inspiration and we start the work. Up here on this table, we have our uh, scale models. This one has Preston Singletary in it right now. So afterwards, you can come up and take a look at that. But what we're doing with these models and scales is familiarizing ourselves with the objects still. How are these going to fit in our space? 
are they going to fit in our space? Can our space handle the weight of them? Um, and so we start sketching. I'm like, so we have all this information from LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, who organized this. We have all this information, and now I have to trust the numbers that these people are giving. And often in this field, you can't trust someone else's numbers. Um, it just is the way that it is. Like, maybe that's 25 inches, but maybe they looked at it and was like, nah, I don't know, it's about 20. Um, so this kind of makes you nervous. And I'm also nervous because this is my first big exhibition. It's a chance to prove myself. And so I'm like sketching out each object to scale in my sketchbook in the groupings that we're sort of putting them in. So I need to know like how big are these next to each other? What do they look like? How much space are they going to take up? Is this too big? Um, and so we're doing that. We're creating a layout up here. So this would be our exhibition entrance. You come in and you can see all these little, these are object placements. And this is an early design. So this will change a little bit, but also kind of stay similar. And here is a 3D rendering of a design. So this isn't a photo. This is like early. We're just working with the spacing of the objects. There's no color in here. There's nothing like that. Just the objects, the space, the pedestals. And so we're continuing to familiarize ourselves. And we're really trying to conjure what is essential to the exhibition. So we're sifting through ideas. There's collaboration amongst exhibition design and curatorial marketing and branding for this one really kind of set the stage. So we had a branding partnership with Coin Creative, and they really helped us refine the look of this exhibition. So earlier we were looking at the mood board. We have this color palette up here, which becomes the color palette for our exhibition and our branding platform. I take that mood board. We have a conversation with Coin Creative, our, bra our branding company. Um, and together, we sort of refine this color palette. We saw the pinks and the blues earlier and the ambers. And that comes to this like sand and this pink powder pink here. But then we're also inspired by the patinas that show up on these bronze sculptures after some time and the, the dark tones as well. And so we get these dark tones here, the patina, and uh, some soft impressionist colors, but also this glow, this copper color, really became this like um, inspired by the glow of the bronze when you're casting it. Um, and so we'll see that throughout the exhibition. So again, we're immersed in sculptures, um, this sort of nice wood setting in the gardens. These are really our key uh, design inspirations and informing us as we go forward. One of the things in, the, in this last year that I've taken on is this digital 3D program. And the program is called Ortelia, and it's sort of a 3D program built by art galleries and art museums for art galleries and art museums. And before, we weren't really working in a 3D program. We would work in these models up here um, and then you know, take that into... Uh, the galleries and create that. So there were, there was confidence in them, but there's also this gap in um, communicating the designs. Like, how do you tell uh, development about an exhibition design when maybe they're not as creatively inclined as the exhibition team or something like that? And so it's it's really hard to sell the vision sometimes. So we start using this 3D program, and these are all 3D renderings um, of galleries that we've created in the last year. So we have. Our Paul Reed works on paper, some of our permanent collection galleries, um, William H. Johnson, Art and Activism, and Rodin. Uh, so I start working with William H. Johnson and Art and Activism, really figuring these programs out and sort of refined it um, with Rodin. So while Rodin is going on also, um, we're redoing half of our second floor and a gallery on the third floor. So we're really sort of reinstalling um, half the museum. And uh, this is like, I believe, close to 200 objects um, across six galleries and two floors. So uh, this is like really a, a pretty big undertaking. And, and the 3D program really helps 
with this because we're we're on a tighter schedule and it really eliminates the guesswork of like how are these objects going to look together and with these colors and things and so this program becomes a problem solver but also a, col a collaborative vehicle to get our branding down um, talk with marketing talk with development and really sell the exhibition part of it also this problem solving thing um, here in our top left, this is the Burgers of Calais, and below is our installation of the Burgers of Calais. So in the designing of this, there was this sort of question about our process space. So our process space, this orange room, I don't know if you're all familiar with this, but you come out of the blue gallery into our orange process space and then into the Burgers installation. But with the process space, it was feeling really uh, dis connected from the rest of the exhibition and part of it was this orange in this image behind the burgers of Calais so this is uh, where it's installed in Calais and we wanted to reference that with a large installation of the image and this image it was kind of throwing it off so it's like what do we do this doesn't really look good um, but early in the exhibition there's like a little bit there's some orange as well and this orange and so we move our creative space to becoming orange. It starts to accentuate all these patina colored pedestals and graphics in there. And it really connects both spaces. Um, and this is all because of the 3D program. Like if we didn't have that and we just went into it with our initial plan, um, it probably still looks good, but it's not like as cohesive. And so we're really trying to create cohesion throughout the museum from like marketing to exhibitions um, to our Wayfair signing. And this is one of the examples of how this really works. Um, the essence of our exhibition is coming together and we are starting to believe in this. This is three galleries, seven sections, 100 objects, 50 pedestals, 11 platforms, a graphic design concept, several, several design features, and we're ready to go. We have our design review and this design process. So earlier I mentioned we started, we got the offer for this exhibition in June when we accept it, sign contracts, move along. Um, my part doesn't really begin until about mid-November. So we had to install a couple other exhibitions before I could begin to work on this. And um, starting in mid-November, I'm doing all the things with the scales, becoming familiar with the objects. Um, we send our first draft off in the middle of December right before Christmas. We get a response in early January and revise. Um, we took meetings with structural engineers to make sure that our floors are gonna be able to support the weight of some of these sculptures that are almost weigh a ton. Um, we're approved internally from our curatorial department, our head of exhibitions, and our CEO. And then we have a object safety briefing with uh, the art handlers from LACMA. And so, they're really looking at the design. Is there safe distance from our guests to the objects? Um, are certain objects under vitrines? Things like that. So we're really, um, this is really about object safety more than like the look of the design. So here is a video uh, that goes through the design. So this is a video from our 3D program. And while we're building it out. So I've been looking at this program. By the time we get to the build out, I've been looking at this layout for a couple months, three months working on it, looking at almost this one for a month and a half every day. And I, I annoyingly start to say, it looks just like the model as we're like building it out. Um, and then everybody's just looking at me like, okay, yeah, cool, that's great. Um, but for me, it's like, oh my God, I think this might work. Um, and so here we're going through the second section, our figure and movement, um, into our process space, and then into the burger space. Um, but here, all of this, um, I don't know. So part of what we're doing is we're able to get information to our preparators, things like that, way ahead of time uh, because we're sure about all these. We've made sure all these pedestals worked and were the right size months in advance. So while it seems hectic, this was one of the smoothest exhibitions that we've had. 
uh, in years. And I know that for sure because I've worked on a lot of them. So that was our 3D program showing us what it can look like and man, does it really just look like that. And uh, like, it's so awesome. So curatorially. So not only we have our curatorial approach and it's didactics and labels and tours and things like this, but some of the other things that we're trying to do um, and we're leading the design informed by the curatorial vision. So we're really trying to enhance the story um, with the assistance of design, but still keeping to the curatorial intention. Um, we're bringing the exhibition experience to a personal level, and we're really elevating ways that we acknowledge and connect with our audience. And so uh, I'm gonna talk about a couple of those things here. Engaging with people, how do we engage with people? We offer information, we offer uh, a visual experience as we can see down here, and we're really just trying to make this an okay place where you don't have to feel like you come in, go to the right, and make your way along through the exhibition. We want you to have the time and the space to sort of wander as you see fit. Um, and we're trying to create spaces that promote that. And we're trying to enhance our story and connect with people. And some of the ways that we do this are extended labels. So people want to know about what they want to know about. So if you walk up to an object and you like this and there's no information on it, you're kind of disappointed. And so we're trying to provide extended labels for every object so that there's information that you want to know about the objects you want to know about. Um, we've also started to use QR codes, which provide um, a deeper look into it, but is also an accessibility thing. We're creating process spaces, having touchable objects. Um, this object here is in the process space, and this is a reproduction of a Rodan hand, um, and it's touchable. And uh, we had this is a thing that we've is new. It's not going to be with every exhibition, but we're really trying to um, break down these sort of uh, perceived barriers. Um, so with the QR codes. Uh, on the William H. Johnson exhibition earlier this year, we had a grant from the Art Bridges Foundation to provide an educational, an alternative educational experience for blind and low vision or alternative ways to experience art. And so we had these 3D reproductions made of some of the artworks in this exhibition, which were touchable and are seen here on these two things. Um, but also with this, we are, um, developing partnerships. So we worked with this partner, this organization, New View. And New View, Oklahoma, is the largest employer of blind and low vision um, people in Oklahoma. Um, they also offer services for blind and low vision that range from like health checkups to uh, teaching people who are either losing their vision or have lost their vision how to use guide canes, um, set their houses up in a way that they are still able to use everything and um, basically like a way to um, live their life. And so we're going to New View. They have a, a manufacturing facility um, on like 6th and Linwood. So we go down there and we take a tour of that. And we're talking to people that work there. Um, we're finding that there's no one answer for every blind or low vision person. And so we start to take these steps. And traditionally, we have black lines in our gallery, which you can see back here. And those are usually just a tape line. And those are lines to say, hey, you're getting close to the art. Please step back a little bit. So we kind of doubled the usage of these. And so these not only become ways to um, keep our objects safe, but they become cane guides. And so this is a way for someone who is blind and low vision to move around our gallery and not feel like maybe they're gonna bump into someone or go into the wrong place. And on these cane guides are these little notches or bump outs, and those indicate that there's something to engage with here. And this is a common practice at that manufacturing facility we went to, and um, the consistency of it here helps people understand when this is here, this means something is happening. And that's our own internal practice of doing that. 
And so we're creating QR codes that people can scan because another thing we found out is that blind, low vision people use our, their phones as this tool to really engage, you know? Like most of us are just scrolling Instagram or something like that, but they're able to scan QR codes or um, do talk, text to talk so you can take a picture of text and it'll read it back to you. Um, and we're really trying to incorporate these technologies into our everyday visitor experience. So we had a grant to fund this and then we created this process to do this ex during this exhibition. And so if we already have the process and it's not as much work as we sort of initially thought and so I sort of began to champion this um, process into every exhibition. So this has been uh, integrated into our exhibition design process and going forward with our permanent collection, traveling exhibitions, um, wayfinding, things like that. We're going to incorporate this blind and low vision accessibility and uh, continue to do that going forward. And so this is an opportunity to uh, create relationship and develop partnerships um, with companies like NewView and um, the amazing people that they have there. So curatorial, now we're, t now we're on to the building. It's time to build, okay? So this is going on. The anxiety is building. Is this going to work? Is it gonna look like the model? And the chance to prove myself, really. Like um, I was promoted from preparator to installation design manager. Um, I'm now working with um, some of the people that I worked for, and uh, I don't want to let these people down. Like, I want to show them that, like, I can do this, we can do this together, and we can uh, do this really well and have a really amazing collaborative process. And so while we're building all of this, we're doing our second floor, um, which is four galleries on the second floor, four galleries on the third floor, and um, a huge team. And... All of this is possible thanks to Trent Lawson. So Trent Lawson has been our, a preparator here for a dozen years maybe, and the chief preparator for the last nine years. Um, Trent is a rock. He is like the unsung hero of the museum. He is a wealth of knowledge. Trent usually knows more than everyone about all the details of the exhibition and then he's like reminding you, oh yeah, I did say that thing. That is what we're doing. Um, and so Trent truly makes it happen. Um, he's amazing. Like there are no, there's no one like Trent. Um, so I would just like to, again, extend a thank you to Trent. He's, he's amazing. Um, Trent, okay, so he builds all this. We go from our concept to our design to our reality. Um, all of this starting in November. We start our build out in April and we're approaching our opening day in at the beginning of June. And it looks amazing. Like look at the crowd full of people. This is what we want. Um, just beautiful looks. And our our grand reveal, these arcades. So real quick, we're gonna take a look at Preston Singletary, Raven in the Box of Daylight. This is a Clinkit creation myth, which is a tribe from the Pacific Northwest and about how Raven steals the daylight and releases it into the world and reveals um, all of the people and animals. And uh, here is a quick look through that. Um, and so this is a multi-sensory exhibition, different than just sculptures and paintings. There are projections and audio that go with it. Here's something that's gonna look like um, as we move down this hallway. And in December, I went to the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. to view this exhibition. That's where some of these photos are from. And uh, just to prepare ourselves for this because this is something like we've never done before. There's, like I said, there's projections that go with this. Um, there's an audio element as well. And so right now we're in the middle of the build out phase of this. We have an electrician installing all the wiring. We just had a construction company leave who was doing a build out for us. And this is gonna be another magical expedition. expedition. Like see, look at that projection there. Um, so 
just come to the end here. And these are the sort of ancestors that are revealed after Raven releases the light. Here's some of the objects. This up here is like 38 feet long, so this is quite huge. Here's our 3D program. Here is a image of a sculpture, and here's a photo of it installed. Here's a design plan, 3D, and then image. That basically wraps up my, my last 12 months. And so my goal in the next year is to begin to integrate technology into the galleries. And some of this is with touchscreen interactions and iPad kiosks. And then um, I also have this RFID chip idea that I haven't told anyone about, but I think it's pretty great. Um, and so in the, hopefully in the next year or two years, um, we'll start to see this technology in the galleries um, and continue to develop and expand the ways we're connecting with our audience and providing opportunities for our audience to engage in art. So with that, are there any questions? Yeah, okay, yeah. So she's asking, what does the color selection process look like for some of the walls? It's like usually like bare knuckles and glass, and then we have to like fight in the round table. Um, no, uh, usually, uh, like we started with that mood board and we had this sort of color palette and um, create multiple versions essentially. So we'll have, if we're going with a green, maybe we have with, with the 3D model, we're able to put like all three greens in there and really see what it looks like or something like that. Um, I will say the gates of hell, let's go, I don't know if that image is in here. We'll go, can we go all the way back to the beginning? Um, so like for this one where this wall is orange, there's these beautiful black and white um, platforms that all of this stuff is on. Like originally I was trying to get those to be magenta and like it would have been really bright and vibrant and they had to be like, calm down. Like, let's bring it back a little bit. Um, and so it's, it's usually just conversation, like I'll present ideas or really start with the conversation with the curator. What does a curator want to see? Um, and then sometimes they have an idea and sometimes they don't. And so then uh, I come with some ideas, they come with some ideas, and we put them together, edit, uh, probably a couple rounds of edits, and then finally decide. Yes, in the... Richard. Yeah, so I back up with the Rodin stuff. Um, yeah. Do you jump on a plane and go to Los Angeles, or do you see their schematic, or do you deliberately not do that? Um, I do not go. I would love. I would have loved to. I don't think it was installed when we got the opportunity. It may have already been a traveling exhibition, and they needed another place. So um, the question was. Do I go and see it, or do I intentionally like keep it from not seeing it so that I'm not influenced? Um, I don't. Neither of those really. Um, I think the exhibition was already traveling. We had seen images of installations at other museums, so we kind of knew what we were getting. And then um, really just doing the research with the checklist and trying to familiarize myself with the objects, like how big are they, how much do they weigh. Um, which ones go together, things like that. Uh, I think some of what you're asking is like, do I want to see what other people are doing? Uh, a little bit and also no. Um, I would say that this probably doesn't look like a Rodin exhibition anywhere, maybe in the world, especially with some of the colors that we chose. Um, and I don't, I take pride in this sort of as like, um, while I am sort of in an academic institution and uh, in an academic process, I'm not an academic in the traditional way that we think about it. And so um, it, I, I think it's an interesting way to approach these on a, like a non-academic level sometimes. And I, I'm just appreciative of the possibility to get to do that, really. Yeah. Uh, 
Yes, you're in the Great office exhibit was unusual in, in first sculpture exhibit in that it had a lot of significant paintings with it as yeah. well. Yeah. Did you take cues from some of the artwork for color? Um, yeah, a little bit. Uh, and mostly what, so we're asking like, do we take color from the paintings as well? Because there's um, quite a few um, masterful paintings that are um, a show in and of themselves. Uh, a little bit. So mostly we're, I was like wanted to stay in that impressionist area, but know that there's, I don't want to, I didn't want to lean too heavy into that because that's usually a, a trope or a thing like these are impressionists, let's be an impressionist palette. And I like to think of things as like, okay, they're impressionist then, but what is that today? And how are we using um, design aesthetic and trends from today with these objects from the past and sort of, but not overdoing it, not putting the design first necessarily. Yeah. Anybody else? In the back, Kate. In the True Nature exhibition, what yes. gallery was the most challenging to design? Kate's asking which gallery was the most challenging to design. Um, probably the first one uh, where you enter and it's the pink one and as you enter here, um, this is really where we have our most sculptures in various sizes from you know, maybe 12 inches to uh, six to seven feet tall. And so fitting these in with paintings and the space to move around while sticking to the um, immersed in objects concept that we began with, uh, it was probably that one, just because we're thinking about mm, ADA accessibility. Can a wheelchair go down this part? Because there's a couple tight areas in there. Um, but uh, yeah, so probably the first one. Yes, over here. The QR codes that lead to the website with the uh, audio um, reading, and then the, again, there's the text for the uh -huh. different objects. Are those going to be linked together so you can just hit next instead of always going to have to scan and pull up a new page? Um, so she's asking about our QR code process and if you can scan one of those, do you have to scan every one or can you just kind of go next? Um, that's something we haven't thought about actually, um, but I could see why that is like a feature. You don't want to pull your phone out and then you're like scanning every time and yeah, just being able to move next. Um, it's not a thing that we've thought about. It is a thing that we will think about going forward. So thank you for that. Here. Um, even with all of the preparation um, so Janan's asking if we had to, with all of our planning, the 3D model, if we had to change anything from the original layout, we did. Um, and some of that was, we had a paint, so some of you may know and some of you may not, we have a giant freight elevator that moves up our galleries. And in those galleries, we have these giant swinging doors and, um, they are safe to hang objects on. Uh, we do it, but not every institution wants to do that. And so we did have some objects on there and they said no, so we made a couple changes. Um, thinking about that, there was in the burgers area, I, while we're about to install it, start to sort of second guess the layout and the spacing and things like that. And we have a conversation and move some objects to see if they should be moved or will look better. And it actually turned out that they should just be like the plan that we had because I had already done that for hours in the program. And then the anxiety of, oh man, this is real and these other people are here and is it gonna work? Started to take over, but what it was really the plan already worked. I had already put the hours into it and um, and it really supported that. Like, so the amount of work that I put into it really showed, uh, like I said, this was one of our smoothest installations in the last few years, which is crazy because this is one of the largest exhibitions that we've done, I think, in, at least since I've been here, maybe in the last decade or ever possibly, um, just in the, the weight of the, the sculptures, the number of sculptures and uh, everything that it took. Corey, here in the front. What part of this exhibition is your favorite? What are you most proud of? Um, Corey's asking, what am I most proud of with this exhibition? I think just 
proving that I'm capable of doing this. Um, so uh, my eyelashes turned white during this. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, a mild case of vitiligo that I have or stress or what, but uh, on my left eye, half of my eyelashes turned white. So I think just like proving that I could do it um, to myself, to my colleagues, uh, to the people. So, yeah. Um, here. I'm going to jump over to Preston Singletary okay. at exhibit because of the narratives that are associated figures in uh, Native American histories and art, is there going to be any storytelling component to the exhibition? Um, I th the exhibition is a storytelling component. So, so here with Rodan, for example, these are we have extended labels for everything. We're really talking about each object as an art piece. And with Preston Singletary, this is more the story about how Raven releases daylight. And instead of the here's the object, here's all about the object. Uh, most of the text and information is really about the story. So it's like you enter with an opening statement of the story, which is um, about <clears throat> being darkness before Raven was white and it lived, there was darkness. And so the exhibition goes in these sort of chapters. Like I think I believe there's eight. And so you get like your first panel and then it, it and they're numbered like one, two, three, four. So uh, the whole exhibition is storytelling based as opposed to look at this object of the raven. Yes. So when you get offered an exhibition like this, do you, do you use every single piece or are you picking and choosing or whatever? Um, yeah, so she asks if we, when we get an exhibition, um, do we use every piece or do we get to pick and choose? Um, in my experience, if it's coming, if it's an organized exhibition coming from an organizing organization or institution, uh, we're really just using the whole checklist unless we're just unable to fit the space. Um, but I think, like, unless an exhibit, there was um, a couple works that fell off the checklist because they were loaned to other institutions and so they were pulled out. Other than that, we kind of stick to what we have there and uh, just work with that. Anybody else? No? Okay. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to hear us out and support the Art Museum.